Hare Krishna. I've decided to stand here because I'm not a tall person and I want to be able to see you as you can see me. Um, I'd like to first to start by thanking the organizers of this uh, convention uh, for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, I'd like to extend some special appreciation to the volunteers uh, who are working with this program. Uh, I've been to many conferences uh, over the years, and I've never seen a volunteer corps quite like this one. So I'd like to really let us just thank them for the work that they're doing. I'd also like to thank you for getting up early in the morning. <laughs> And uh, this indicates your interest in the subject that we need to talk about this morning. Uh, it is truly the elephant in the room that we don't like to talk about, but it's crippling us and therefore we have to talk about it. Uh, when uh, Brother Fauzan invited me, I asked him, do you know what I do? He said, yes. So he gave me permission to talk freely uh, to you on, on, on the subject uh, at hand. Uh, but before I get into the issue of freeing our mosques, and I also think that this is a very important component of that process, the issue of domestic violence, we touched on it last night, but I really felt compelled to speak very plain and clearly that we have to have zero tolerance for domestic violence in our community. No safe haven, no coddling, no sheltering, right? We have to speak very clearly about that. Otherwise, we are complicit in the perpetuation of this criminal activity in our community against our women. We can't have it. We can't raise wholesome, healthy families if the women are living in fear, often of their lives, literally slaves in their own households. Wallahi, emotional slaves. So we have to be clear. We have to be strong to speak truth to power and say there's no safe, no safe haven for abusers. And yes, sometimes women are the abusers, but it's rare. It's our men who are suffering this pathology. And we need to get them help like any other person who's sick. But we cannot leave our families to grow up in these pathological environments. Our children don't deserve it. The women certainly don't deserve it. And ultimately, the community doesn't deserve it. So I hope that we will be clear that we are not going to tolerate it at all. And when we find brothers who are ill in this way, we have to alert the community because we can't allow them to go from one abusing environment and marry someone else's daughter and continue that behavior. Now, I know this is not an easy conversation to have, but I mean, just recently, a brother decapitated his wife, pillar of the community. You know? I mean, she didn't just die. She was murdered. Now, that's a more gruesome example of what happens. But there are all kinds of nuances in between how women are living in fear of their lives and that they pass on, they transmit this pathology to their children so that their children become the abusers. And how can we have a wholesome uh, society when we are hiding this ugly little secret in our closet? So please, brothers and sisters, and especially the imams and the other men in our community, you have to stand up and, and say no to this kind of behavior. And you have to protect the women in the community. We shouldn't just have to be the ones to learn the martial arts and all of these things to try and protect ourselves. You are supposed to 
do that for us as well. You have mothers, you have daughters, and of course you have wives. And I know you don't want that for any of the women folk in your family. So let us be clear. It's no tolerance for domestic violence. If someone is ill, put them in an environment where they can get help, but safety first. You do not send a woman back into a home and tell her to be patient. You know, 911 is the number to call. How many do you got? Now, this issue of women's access to mosques, uh, we've been working on it for some years now. And I'd like to make some clarifications right from the start. Because often when we have this conversation, some people confuse the issue that we are advocating with our desire to uh, lead Juma prayer, for instance. That's not what we're advocating, right? We are advocating that women should have equal access to the mosque, not only to come and worship, but to be involved in its management and the governance of that mosque. Yeah. Because guess what? Women know best what women need in the community. Brothers may know some things, and they may think they know more, but women know best about what their needs are. And you know what? Women are the ones who are raising the family. We are the ones who are raising the nation. So why would we tie one hand behind our back and try to build a wholesome, viable society? It's not going to happen. And those people in the society who are not our well-wishers, they know this about us, another dirty little secret in our closet. They, they know about it very well. So we have to be open, honest, and bold enough to attack and address the pathologies in our community so that we can grow healthy, flourishing families because it's not going to happen otherwise. Women are living in a society these days where they are doing all kinds of work in the society. They're really helping build a nation outside of the Muslim community. Why? Because they don't have access to utilize their gifts within the community. Who suffers for that? We do as a community. So we clearly need to make some changes. Now, we're not being radical either, you know, so we don't want to be painted with that radical feminist brush, yeah? We are hearkening back to the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And we were told, we we're taught, that in the Prophet's mosque, peace be upon him, there was no wall and there were no curtains. And it surely wasn't because they didn't have bricks, mortars, and fabric. He had that. But there were no barriers. The women were in the same prayer space with the men, the women and the children. So why, why do we think we are better than those people uh, around the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him? So we have to do this, and we are really going to find that when we do, our communities are going to grow exponentially. Women are just sitting on talents because they are not willing any longer to sit in the back room, you know, to go to the back of the bus. I didn't become a Muslim, certainly, to sit in the back bus, the back of the bus. I grew up in the South. I'm very familiar with the civil rights movement. And Mrs. Rosa Parks is one of my sheroes, right? So I'm not sitting in the back of the bus. And I encourage every woman to refuse to sit in the back of the bus any longer. Just say no. Just say no. And the enlightened men in our environment should be the first ones to say, that's right. You know, open up these doors and let my mother, my sister, my daughter in. I don't want them to be treated as second-class citizens. And we have to believe that Allah surely didn't create us to be re-enslaved. You know, Islam for us was this liberating force. So when I hear uh, Tariq Ramadan, for instance, talking about being free, that resonates with me. You know? Islam freed us in this part of the world for sure. You know? I mean, we were truly in dire need of some relief. 
And Allah chose us, Allah honored us, dignified us with Islam. So there's no way we're going to accept the treatment that many of our women are suffering now. And I think that it starts at the mosque. When I embraced Islam in the early 70s, we practically lived in the mosque. We were there all the time. I was raised as a Christian, and that experience was you went to the church and you did uh, practically everything. Your life was in the church. And certainly children were socialized in that environment. Okay? So you come in with the full expectation that you're going to have that freedom and that access to learning and spiritual enrichment in your mosque. And we had that for many years. So now we are regressing. We are, at those times, we didn't have these grand structures that were built from the ground up, you know, these masajids that are, that are opulent, you know? But they have these gilded cages, beautiful cages, you know, with the glass, the plated glass, and what? You know, it's the, when we walk out in the street, we encounter men and women every day. And surely when we go to our workplace, we encounter men and women every day. And surely the women and men in our community are strong enough as Muslims not to think that if they look at a woman, somehow you know, they're going to degenerate or somehow deteriorate into some kind of predator if, uh, if women are not just erased from, from vision. This, this is totally... Uh, unrealistic, it's unsustainable because, you know, there are some statistics that have been done recently and women are just not going to the mosque anymore. You know, they don't feel welcome, they don't feel at home. It's not friendly environment. So they don't go. And as a result, their children are increasingly not going. Now, what kind of society are you going to ha have if young people start to say, well, I'm not going to this place anymore because there's nothing there for me. And furthermore, it demeans me when I go there. You know? So we have access to all of this wonderful traditional learning and lofty ideals that Islam uh, gives to us. Uh, how are we expected to implement that in our lives if we're still holding on to cultural baggage that devalues women? And make no mistake about it, when we say women, we mean the family. Because without strong women, you're not going to have any nation. You're not going to have any strong children in the dean. You're just not going to have it. And you can't dictate that just because you're the man. Yeah? So we have to be very serious about addressing this issue. Everybody in every community should go back to where they live and begin to engage the mosque leadership there to address these issues. I mean, there's, there's no excuse for this kind of treat. It's discrimination. You know, let's call it what it is. We have language that we can use. You know, this is discrimination against women. Now, our women don't usually complain a lot one of the brothers earlier uh, in the beginning of the con uh, convention was saying, complain, <laughs> you know, make some noise. You know, say you're not satisfied, you know. This is not okay. Because often brothers don't know what it feels like. When they go into the mosque, it's a beautiful place where they go. I mean, you, you automatically are transported into another space, you know, a spiritual space. It's the lovely carpeting and chandeliers and it's beautiful. And then you walk to the same masjid around the corner or down in the basement or, and the women are in broom closets or I stuff a lot. You know, it's like, it's such a dishonoring of our women. Really, really, really. Can't, it has to stop. If anybody has to go to the basement or to the attic, the men should go. You know, very serious. You should be providing the most beautiful space for your women and for your children. The most beautiful space for them. You can go to the attic. You can sit on the ground. You can do that. You are men. Make, make do. 
but make sure that your women, the people who are raising your children and your nation have the best view, the best place, so that when you can look back and say, oh, you know, my family is wholesome and thriving and contributing to the community, you can really say that in earnest. But we're not doing that now. And nobody's perfect. I mean, we just have to own our own uh, mess and clean it up, you know, and just get on with the business uh, of the day. And this is very important business because we're not feeling okay. Women are not feeling okay. They're not complaining a lot, but they're not feeling okay. You can't feel okay when you, in the world, you are working as a professional in all aspects of the society. Everybody outside the community respects you for your expertise. They call on you for your expertise. Women are powering other organizations outside the Muslim community, powering them. And the minute they walk into the masjid, they are immediately relegated to second-class status. What does that say to her? Any intelligent woman, you're just like, why should I put up with this? Do you think that our young girls are going to put up with this? They're going to say, I, why not? I'm just not going. You know, I, why, why should I do that? And that's truly a brain drain. We can't afford it. And there is a downward trend where women are not going to the mosque anymore. Young people are not going to the mosque anymore. And don't be deceived, you know. Don't be in an illusion that when you walk into a place, you see a lot of energetic, you know, young Muslim women and uh, men, you know, eager to be in uh, the company of the shiuk. And, uh, you know, it's almost the rarity. Most people are just yearning to be free, <laughs> really, in our Dean. And the only way it's going to happen is if we make it happen with Allah's help. And we have to start by opening up the masajid. We have to free this space. And not only should it be open and inviting and welcoming to Muslims, non-Muslims should also feel comfortable coming to the mosque also. You all, you all like to do dawah, right? You, you really. I mean, People outside the Muslim community are just eager to know what's going on. You know, I mean, we have some friends out there that we don't even know about. But we're so caught up in our own little stew that we can't look beyond ourselves. Sometimes when we go to meetings or organizations uh, for any kind of work that we do, um, people are practically saying, well, where were you? We were waiting for you. You know, they're very, very happy to have us with them, you know. So we have to really get busy and make our places open and inviting progressive, you know. You know? And dawah is by example. It doesn't matter how much you talk the talk. If you don't walk the walk, everybody knows it, yeah? So it's better to talk less and walk more. People will want to know what's going on there. Who are those people? What are they doing? And look at those women, you know? Despite our shortcomings, women are still coming to Islam in droves. Thank God they read, you know? But they're still coming, subhanAllah. And, you know, people who are not Muslim are wondering, I can't imagine why they are, because look at their religion and how they treat their women, you know? But I embraced Islam through my readings and understanding that this position that Islam bestows on a woman is so high and lofty that, you know, that's what I want to be. And I was asked once, I can't imagine you as an African-American woman knowing about slavery and going through the civil rights movement and that you would become a Muslim. I'm, she couldn't understand. And I had to explain to her that that's, that's precisely why. I became a Muslim because of the status, the honor that Islam bestows on the woman. See? So we can't tolerate it. We can't have it, you know? We can't have women walking around with cauliflower ears, black eyes, broken eyes. We can't have it. Can't have it. Very, very serious. We can't have it. And now I'm going to talk to the women, right? You have to step up. You have to say, no way. 
you know, you may do it once, but, but you know, that's, it, it, it's over, you know? You have to make some demands. You know, Islam bestowed this honor on you. It's beneath your dignity to be treated less than. You know, how are you gonna tell your daughters and your granddaughters? What, what are you gonna tell them about Islam? That we have to go to the back of the bus or the basement or the broom cellar, you know, to pray. It's ridiculous, you know, I mean, it's, any thinking person is not going to accept that, you know. And you can only impose it for so long. As soon as they come of age, they're out of here, they're gone. You know, they might show up for age, but that's it. So look at the drain, look at the loss we are suffering as a result of our unwillingness to apply Islamic principles over cultural practices. So this is what we have to do, and I know that we're all up to the challenge. And I also say to our brothers, don't be afraid of strong women. It's women who have to raise those men, though. Women have to raise men who are strong enough to not be afraid of women. They're accustomed to seeing strong women. They're accustomed, to, they grow up with women doing things, so they're not in fear of that, you see? But that's the woman's job. You have to do that. You have to do that, sisters. And, and you know, there's no excuse. I, Societies do all kinds of things, but here you are living in the West, you know, with some modicums of freedom, you know. And we always say that women, the power of the woman, the power of the spiritual woman, is, it, it can be frightening, really, you know. I mean, you can do stuff, <laughs> really, you know. You can do stuff. If you ground yourself in your spirituality and you stand up, but what you know is right, people are gonna come to you. You know, you don't have to speak. You just walk. You're just a magnet, you know? So you have to be that same way inside the community. You just do what you need to do. And sometimes you have to be, you have to talk, you know? And you don't always have to sit in the back, you know? Then when we have some formation for Salat, but it doesn't mean lectures and everywhere you go, you have to sit in the back. No, come up front. You know, make a habit that from now on, whenever I go to a program, I'm gonna take the first row, not the back row. Just do it. And guess what, nobody will even care. They won't even notice you, you know? But you will be making a statement not only for yourself, but for the women behind you who wouldn't dare otherwise. So you have to do it. So sometimes we won't do things for ourselves, but we'll do it for our children, yeah? We'll do it for other people because that's how magnanimous women are. Allah endowed us with this stuff. So do it for our girls and our boys because you're raising them too, yeah? And you can teach them anything you want them to know at the breast. I see a big room back there for nursing, right? You can teach them anything. Only the woman can do that. Men can't do that. Only women can do that work. And that's raw power. You have this in your hand. And these are our flowers. And they deserve no less. And when they see you devalued, subjugated, broken, not feeling okay about yourself, you think they don't know that? Kids are very intuitive. You don't have to say stuff. They just know things are not okay. And conversely, when they know that things are well with you and in the home, they're fine and they pick that up and then they generate that in the society. So may Allah give us the strength, you know, to just stand up, be bold and say no. If I'm going to this mosque, I want to be involved in that mosque. You know, we give our money to places that don't even acknowledge us. You know, sometimes when we're doing fundraisers, brothers actually, my time is up, brothers actually come and say to the sister's section, uh, so the sister, uh, they, 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 you don't have any money, right? But then they'll say, well, will you send over your gold bracelet or your gold earrings, right? Well, you need to stop putting your gold bracelets and your earrings in that sadika box if they're not providing any service for you. But now the ball is in the sister's court. 
because you have the power to change, wallahi. And this is not a feminist statement, this is an Islamic statement, wallahi. Assalamu alaikum.